want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. But I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Second Corinthians chapter 12 this morning, so find your place in your Bibles and your phones. We've got ten verses to cover. I'm going to read them through, and then we'll come back and pick things apart. Starting in verse 1, it says, and this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Father, as we come to the text this morning, we pray that you would uh, help us to understand what's going on here, why this was originally written, what it means for us today. There's a lot that we could pull out of this text, and I intend to do as much as I can in the next 45 minutes or so. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us, being the true teacher in this room, impressing upon us the things that we need right now, today. I pray that I will be faithful to the text, that you will work through this time that we've set apart in our study of your word, that we might all benefit from this. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've been with us for the last several weeks, I don't want us to lose context of what's going on in here. You remember that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. Primarily, these last few chapters have been to defend himself against critics that have infiltrated that church and to discredit their uh, reputation as apostles of God because Paul knows that they're not apostles of God. He knows that they're false. And so he's really looking to rescue his people from their fraudulent teaching, their influence. Paul is trying to protect God's people from false teachers both then and now. God's word is timeless. And when we read a passage like this, I think we can get kind of lost in the details. Like, oh, this is that one part in the Bible where Paul talks about going to heaven. This will be interesting. Or, or this is the part, the thorn in the flesh, and, and how strength is, is made perfect in weakness. And, and that's an interesting subject. But really the backdrop of this whole thing is Paul is doing his best to protect God's people from false teaching and false teachers. And so we have to approach the text like that if we're going to give it any honor. If people paid attention today to what is taught in these 10 verses, or really what Paul's been teaching, a lot of false teachers today in 2015 would not be nearly as influential as they are. However, it seems that naivety among Christians might be at an all-time high because the influence of these types of men and women have created an entirely new religion in this culture and worldwide under the banner of Christianity with false teachers 
who present false doctrines, giving false promises, providing false hopes, preaching a false gospel about a false Christ in the face of a false God, and gathering by the thousands false converts, who then become false witnesses and false evangelists, propagating the false religion that Paul is so adamantly working to stop. Yet, because we don't pay attention when we read the Bible, or we don't read the Bible at all, we don't know the warning that God has left for us 2,000 years later, therefore, we're oblivious to the attacks of false teachers upon Christendom, and we're naive to the truth of God's Word, which, which, which would protect us from the absorption of false teaching. And now we find ourselves, 2,000 years later, after these warnings have been given to the church, saturated with ridiculous, unbiblical doctrine. And I would suggest to you that it's much the same today as it was then. The first ten verses of this chapter alone, if we read them carefully, would be all that's needed, completely sufficient, to destroy what a lot of false teachers are saying in modern churches across this world to propagate their false beliefs which is ironic because that's exactly Paul's intent in writing this letter 2,000 years ago, to destroy what false teachers are teaching. Paul, in saying what he has just said in our text this morning, is giving the ultimate qualifier for his, disciple, his apostleship. That's what he's been doing in all of chapter 11 and beyond. He's been saying, listen, listen, I, this is very uncharacteristic of me. This is very uncomfortable for me. I, I, I believe in the uh, virtues of humility and godliness in an individual, but aside of that, I'm now forced to boast and brag about my accomplishments in order for you to see that I am who I say I am. I've been sent by God as an apostle to do the work that I've done. Those men in your church are fakes. He's now been bragging of his accomplishments, of his qualifications, and here he's giving his ultimate qualifier. Now, before we get into this, I want to clarify for us a few of the terms that Paul is using, because if we don't, we might kind of lose the impact. First of all, what's Paul talking about when he talks about the third heaven? You see that verbiage or whatever? He says third heaven in verse 2. He also re, uh, refers to it in verse 4 as paradise. We know that he's talking about heaven. The reason he calls it the third heaven is because in Jewish vernacular, they would have understood by now that the atmosphere that you can see, the, the sky where birds fly, that was the first heaven. And then when the sun goes down, you'll notice that you can see further up, right? Then all of a sudden stars become visible, and now you're looking out into the universe. That was what they would refer to as the second heaven. Paul saying, uh, I know a guy who is caught up into the third heaven. Now, where would that be? And that would be in the eternal realm in which God presides. This is the supernatural realm. He's talking what you and I would refer to as heaven. Paradise, he calls it. It's a term that Christ used when he was being crucified on the cross. And he told the thief next to him that today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise meaning the afterlife, the eternal realm, God's presence. So that's what Paul means. He's talking about somebody being caught up in heaven. He says in verse 7 that there was a thorn in the flesh. Now we want to know what Paul is talking about when he says thorn in the flesh. If I asked you this morning if you were familiar with this passage, have you ever heard the term thorn in the flesh? How many of you have heard the term thorn in the flesh? Most of us are familiar with this. And, and oftentimes we ascribe to our own thorns in the flesh, right? It might mean... Anything from kind of my boss has been riding me at work and that's my thorn in the flesh right now or, you know, I got, you know, I got arthritis and that's my thorn in the flesh. And I don't know, man, if, if Paul was hearing us reduce the severity of the, quote, thorn in the flesh to arthritis or a bad job, I think he might be inclined to roll his eyes. When Paul is talking about this thorn in the flesh, the Greek word that he uses for thorn is actually steak, not the steak that you grill, but the sharpened wooden pole that you would use to anchor a tent. I'm not talking your camping tent. I'm talking um, 
block party tent, Yeshua Palooza tent, you follow me? Uh, if you've ever seen those, uh, those stakes, they're like this tall. You ever try to pull those things out? They have to have a special device just to get them out of the ground once they're in. This is a sharpened wooden pole. When Paul says that I have received this thorn in the flesh, he's going, I've been impaled through the chest with a pole. Okay? Arthritis would be awesome right now. You know? Now, this thorn in the flesh, we get further clarification to what he's talking about when he says it's a messenger of Satan. This thorn in the flesh is a spiritual thing. Let's not think physical. Some people think it was his, like he had bad eyes. Um, in church history, you can read that his condition wasn't the greatest. He had some eye, he made his eyes kind of pussy all the time, and he just couldn't see good, and I don't know what. But if you read commentary on what this thorn in the flesh was, there are dozens of suggestions, and nobody knows. I don't think we need to dig too deep because Paul tells us what it was. It was a messenger of Satan. What does that mean? Well, messenger, the Greek word is uh, angelos or something like that. It means angel. So what, what he's saying is uh, this thorn in the flesh was an angel. But because it was an angel of Satan, we know that he's referring to a fallen angel, a demon. Paul is being tormented by the presence of demons in his life. And I want you to understand something else. If you back up just a little bit, it says that it was given to him. It didn't come to him as an attack. It was given to him as something helpful, something to, in his own terminology, that God used to buffet him. Who was it that gave this demon to Paul as a stake through his chest? It was God. It was God, and that is exactly why Paul says, I asked God to take it away. God can take it away because it was God who gave it. And he knows where to go in order for, to ask for it to be removed. God. Because God is the one who provided with him with it in the first place. Now all of this becomes interesting for us because Satan's involvement may or may not be in Paul's personal life. It may or may not be in Paul's personal life. Where we do see Satan very involved is in Paul's corporate church life. You remember that Paul has already indicated that those false apostles that had infiltrated the church that he so loved were actually ministers of Satan, there to work Satan's agenda in the church that Paul had bled for, the, Paul, the church that Paul loved and fought to preserve, and Satan is ruining it. And so I find it interesting that in contrast to false teachers, false prophets, who use and abuse the church in order to make life better for themselves, Paul has sacrificed his love for the church, which is and has become the greatest source of pain and discomfort that he knows. Satan was turning the church into a thorn in Paul's flesh. What was the greatest problem in Paul's life? Huh, the church that he loved. The thing that he loved the most became the biggest pain in his existence. And yet he wouldn't give up on them. That is very uncharacteristic of a false apostle. False apostles will take from the church. They're marked by greed. They will manipulate in order to get Paul completely opposite. He was giving everything that he had for the church in spite of the fact that the church was a source of such great pain. He indicates that also in the last chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, he says, besides these other things, which there was quite a list, he says, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I mean, he is in, in, in considerable and consistent anguish over the condition of the church. And when he sees the church fall, and flounder, he, he feels the pain of that. Look at in verse 29, he says, Who is weak and I'm not weak? When I see you under attack, man, that is heavy on me. Who is made to stumble and I don't burn with indignation? He goes, when, when I hear reports of, of false teachers coming in there and teaching you lies, I burn with anger. He goes, what's going on in your church is not leaving me unaffected. And God used this in Paul's life to buffet him, to condition him, 
to toughen him, make him resilient. I want you to notice Paul's humility in this whole thing. Now, he's, we know he's talking about himself when he talks about this guy who went to heaven, but he doesn't refer to himself. He says, I know a guy who went to heaven. You remember how Paul is very reluctant to show any indication of pride? He doesn't want anybody to think you know, like he's bragging or anything. It really bothers him. And, and so now here he's going to have to bring out this story of having gone to heaven, but how am I going to do this without sounding like I'm being overtly conceited? Well, I'll just refer to myself in the third person. Oh, I know a dude who went to heaven once. Just so you know, he's being very humble. And he gives very little detail about his experience, if you didn't notice. The only thing he tells us about his visit to heaven is that he heard some really cool stuff. And he doesn't even tell us what that cool stuff is. He goes, in fact, God made it criminal for me to report what I heard up there. I can't tell you. It's not lawful. Well, Paul, tell us a little more. I mean, were the streets really made of gold? What was, what was the pearly gates like? You know what I mean? Was there angels? Did you see God? What did God look like? What did Jesus look like? Did you shake hands with him? Did he talk to you in person? Paul doesn't divulge any of that. He doesn't disclose any other information other than that. I heard some stuff. That's all. I just, I heard some stuff. And if you noticed, he went to heaven 14 years ago. This happened 14 years ago, and this is his first mention of it. I mean, apparently, he didn't, he wasn't eager to give details to even provide the fact that he had gone there. Why did he wait 14 years? Why did Paul wait for 14 years to tell anybody that he had had this experience? I'll give you three reasons. One, it's not profitable. He tells us that in, in, in the first verse. He says, what I'm about to tell you isn't profitable at all, but I have to tell you because now suddenly I see that there might be a little bit of profit in this. And I'll get to what the actual profit was in him telling about his trip to heaven in a minute. But Paul sees that there is no profit, it serves no purpose to disclose his experience. Because listen to me clearly here, you guys. Experience alone is nothing to base your faith on. If, if experience is the only foundation you've got for whatever faith it is that you hold to, you have a weak foundation. And I don't know if you know this, but there is a whole lot of quote-unquote Christianity out there that is built on nothing but experience. Experience that oftentimes supersedes what the Bible teaches. Well, I know the Bible says this and that, but actually my experience... And so now, in regard to people going to heaven, like afterlife experiences, you know, those near-death, out-of-body things that you hear so much about and that people write books about, they ask you in those books to believe things that are unbiblical based on the fact that, well, I experienced it. It would be a, an act of utmost folly for you to buy into that stuff. And there are people lining up to read these books and to go to these conferences no one should trust somebody based on their experiences. So Paul knows that it doesn't have any value, it doesn't have any profit, because it was just an experience. But he does give us the information and the reason for which I will give you in a moment. Second reason Paul waits for 14 years to mention anything about it is because he treasured the experience that he had. It's not that the experience itself didn't have any value to him. It had no value doctrinally to anybody else. But it was certainly something to be treasured for him personally. We see this in Mary, you know, Mary, Mother Mary, the woman who gave birth to Jesus. Throughout his life and his experiences, there were things that would happen where she would, quote-unquote, treasure them in her heart. She would, she would hold them dear and near. She wouldn't disclose that information. She wouldn't go around bragging about it to everybody. You can read it twice in Luke chapter 2. One of them was when Jesus was 12 and she goes back to get him because, you know, he's in the temple teaching the teachers. And, I mean, this was just a crazy thing. And she goes back and she... I don't know how long the caravan had been out. It was a few days, I think. And then they realized, oh, Jesus isn't with us. You know, like, oops, I don't know, you know, we lost God. Hmm. So we have to turn back, go back to Jerusalem. And there's Jesus in church talking to the religious people and, and like schooling them as a 12-year-old. And so she's like, Jesus, we got to go home. 
get in the car. And then the Bible says she just kept quiet about it. She pondered, pondered these things in her heart. Like, she's not going to go and broadcast these events to the world. And Paul's not going to either. Because to do so steals the experience of its value. Much unlike the frauds that we have today who have a near-death, out-of-body experience, and you've you got to be familiar with the other making major motion pictures out of this stuff, best-selling books. They're writing full books and making feature films and holding conferences and going on tour and doing media interviews, giving full disclosure to everything they experienced, unlike Paul, who gives no detail whatsoever other than the fact that he heard some stuff. There was a book put out in 2010 it was called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. It was written by Kevin Malarkey about his son, Alex, a six-year-old whose spinal column was completely severed in a car accident. The boy then had some experiences and went on to embellish on those experiences and, and the father, of course, working with him to write this book only to, in the end, have Alex's mother, Beth, report, quote, these modern testimonies are simply untrue, end quote. She and Alex had already been doing everything they could to get the word out that the boy who came back from heaven, the book, told a largely imaginary story and that most of the details had been greatly embellished and exaggerated in the writing. Publicity about the book had incited a cult of afterlife enthusiasts and hangers-on who wanted to canonize Alex and idolize him as a mystical seer with a, an open connection to heaven. Alex was uncomfortable with the feeling of moral and spiritual responsibility his sudden fame had thrust on him. Still a child, he nevertheless understood that the truth was more important than his own reputation. The publisher, however, refused to pull or alter the book. Alex's father, thrilled with the book's bestseller status, stood with the publisher. Even a pastor from whom Alex sought counsel said that he thought the book was blessing people. He advised Alex to be quiet and let it ride. Last year, you and I saw another best-selling book become a movie, Heaven is for Real, and I have been waiting for that movie, that book, the details therein, to be exposed as fraudulent. Why do I need a four-year-old to tell me what heaven is like when the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John already did a fine job? Save your money. It's a terrible movie, and I can say that without having seen it because it's, it's, it's heresy. Now, why is those things so popular? Because I might suggest that Christian naivety might be at an all-time high. We're buying this stuff up left and right. By the way, anyone who claims to have an out-of-body experience, I mean, there's people out there that haven't written books on their experience, that they'll insist that they had an out-of-body experience. If they have, might I suggest to you that they are not having the same experience that Paul did. Because Paul says it twice. I wasn't sure whether I was out of the body or still in the body. It was so real I might have been there physically, but I'm not sure. So if anybody insists that they had an out-of-body experience, it's simply not the same thing. There's a third reason why Paul waited 14 years to mention this, <laughs> and it's more doctrinal. Paul waited for so long to even mention such an experience of going into heaven and then coming back to report on it because no one, Jew or Gentile, would have ever believed him. Okay? Jews, they believe in the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say about this? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4 says, rhetorical question, who has gone up to heaven and come back down? What, what would Jews say the answer to that is? Nobody. Here's what Jesus says in the New Testament, John 3, 13. No one has ever gone into heaven and returned. 
So if Paul comes along and going, you know, hey, by the way, guys, uh, I just want you to know that um, I'm writing a book uh, called um, uh, I've Gone to Heaven and Back, and um, it's, it's set for release next spring, and we're going to make a movie about it. Everybody in the religious community, whether believer or unbeliever, would have went, you're an idiot. We don't, even, Christian, we don't even agree with the Christians, and we both know what the Bible says. Paul's story is absurd, isn't it? I mean, in this culture, in this era, that early on, for somebody to make such a claim is absolutely absurd. It's doubtful that anybody at this point in history was out there making so bold a claim as he just did. And you contrast that with what we hear today from pulpit celebrities, you'd think that going back and forth to heaven was the norm. I don't know if you know the name Kenneth Hagin, him and people like him in that circle. I'm just going to, I'm going to name drop today a little bit. Todd Burpo, he's the one who wrote the uh, Heaven is for Real. Kevin Malarkey, Alex Malarkey, good for Alex, by the way, coming clean on the whole thing. There's a lot of false teachers and false prophets out there that they need to come clean because they're mentioning their near-death experiences and their out-of-body experiences, and they make it seem as if going to heaven and coming back is a normal, regular thing. It comes out from their, their pulpits and their preaching, and they're talking about having conversations with Jesus in person. And it's like, are you kidding me? Why would somebody make such a claim today? Why, are there, why has this become such a popular thing? You, know, you want to know the answer to that? Um, beside fame and money, the answer to that was already given by the Apostle Paul in chapter 11, verse 12. Look at it with me, if you would. Paul says, I'm doing this so that I will also, I will also continue to do this so that I may cut off the opportunity from those, the false apostles, who desire what? What do the false apostles uh, desire? An opportunity to be regarded just as the real apostles are in the things of which they boast. Why has this become such a popular thing in pulpits across this country, in false churches, among false apostles, false teachers, spitting false doctrine? Because they want to be seen as real apostles. So just like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I've gone to heaven too. And I've had a more recent experience with Jesus Christ. And he told me things that, yes, they're not in the Bible. And yes, they may seem to contradict the Bible. But you have to believe me, not Paul, because I had them more recently than he did. Boy, is this a dangerous game. And you would not believe. I mean, I, whether or not you know what's actually out there in churches this morning, worldwide, is beyond me. But I will give you a fair warning that this doctrine and this kind of stuff has saturated us to a degree that, that goes beyond what we might be aware of. I mean, you're never going to get this faith teaching from me. Claim it, brother! You sick? Claim healing in the name of Jesus! Amen? Get you all worked up, right? It's always the amen and the hallelujah and amen. Oftentimes, I'm not going to say all the time, but oftentimes that's the kind of language that's used among preachers who have no substance to their preaching. They've got to get you worked up emotionally with lots of amens, hallelujah. God help me if I have that little substance to my preaching. The reason that Paul gives so little detail about his experience in heaven is that his trip to heaven isn't the point that he's trying to make. In fact, he's not bringing that up at all just to bring that up. The thorn in the flesh, that is the point he's trying to make. And the thorn in the flesh only makes sense if you know why Paul had the thorn in the flesh. Why did God give him the thorn in the flesh? Well, God gave me the thorn in the flesh to keep me humble, and the reason I needed to stay humble was because, well, um, <laughs> He actually took me to heaven once, and that really gets to a man's head. I mean, when God takes you on a personal vacation to heaven, that'll really work your ego over, boy. I mean, the greater the blessing, the greater the privilege a man of God has, the more humbling he is required to knock him back down to earth. And Paul says, mine is a sharpened pole through the chest cavity. It isn't bad eyes. 
It isn't arthritis. It, it isn't those petty ailments that everybody feels. That's not the thorn in the flesh. He says, the amount of my exultation corresponds to the amount of my pain and humbling. I was so far taken up that God had to sharpen a stick and ram it through just to keep me level-headed. Why is this thorn in the flesh such an important part of Paul's presentation in his attempt to discredit the false apostles? Why does Paul want his people to know that he has this thorn in the flesh at all? I mean, in order to make the thorn in the flesh make any sense, he has to bring up something that he's kept secret for 14 years. This must be an important piece of information, this thorn in the flesh. Why is Paul so adamant about them knowing this detail about his life? The reason is, Paul is proving that he is at God's mercy, not vice versa. Paul's going, I am at God's mercy. Unlike false apostles who would claim that they've got a handle on God and they control the Holy Spirit and Jesus does their bidding. Paul says, that ain't me. Self-exaltation is a trademark of false apostles, then and now. Self-exaltation. In chapter 11, verse 20, look at what Paul says. He says, you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you. He's talking about the false apostles that are doing this to them. If one takes from you, if one exalts himself. Self-exaltation is a trademark of false apostles. They elevate themselves over others. They elevate themselves over the people. But they don't stop there because that's not enough. And they continue on to elevate themselves eventually above God. False apostles elevate themselves above God, which is no surprise because Satan's ministers do just like Satan does. Satan wanted to elevate himself above God. So if a minister of Satan infiltrates the church, it only makes sense that they would do the same. False apostles, false teachers, both then and now, they make their people believe that they have ultimate authority over you, ultimate authority over God, and ultimate authority over even Satan. All right? This is very true of false apostles. They parade themselves on stage behind pulpits, exalting themselves while demeaning Christ and God, yelling at the devil, and mocking the Holy Spirit. I could show you video clips. If I haven't prepared any, but just do a little YouTube research. I'll give you some names. Check out Morris Cerullo, talking about exalting themselves. Here's a quote from him. He says, you're not looking at Morris Cerullo, you're looking at God. You're looking at Jesus. He said this. They demean Christ. Listen to what Kenneth Copeland says. Satan conquered Jesus at the cross. Wait a second. I, last time I checked, Jesus whooped him. Coming back from the death, he beat Satan, sin, and death. I mean, it was a that was a hat trick. <laughs> Satan is done. They yell at the devil. They demean God. Listen to this. Kenneth Copeland also says, the biggest failure in the whole Bible is God. <laughs> this guy, he doesn't read the Bible. He probably should. They yell, at the they yell at the devil. I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Tilton. This is a transcript taken from the television. This is what he said on, on TV. Satan, you demonic spirits of AIDS, an AIDS virus, I bind you. You demon spirits of cancer, arthritis, infection, migraine, headaches, pain, come out of that body. Satan, I bind you. You foul demon spirits of sickness and disease. Satan, I bind you. You nicotine spirits, I bind you in the name of Jesus. It was kind of fun to say that, you know, but I mean, it's high energy, isn't it? <laughs> Keeps you awake, you know, in an otherwise completely boring transcript. Again, no substance. What's this? I bind you, Satan. I bind you. Amen. How I bind you. Has that guy ever read the book of Jude? I mean, you read the book of Jude. It says these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of all angels, didn't dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. 
But these people scoff at things that they don't understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them to do, and so they bring about their own destruction. And talk about mocking the Holy Spirit. That's what their entire ministry is about. These folks, Rodney Howard Brown, uh, Benny Hinn, they, they, they abuse the Holy Spirit in claiming that they have the ability to ball it up like a baseball and throw it at you and then knock you on the ground, or physically. Uh, they even have catchers in their churches to catch people who keep fainting. Um, Rodney Howard Brown brought into the mix uh, something called holy laughter, and if you've seen these things, Google holy laughter, you'll find some interesting um, clips. People laughing uncontrollably and shaking and falling down and can't stop laughing. It's like, listen, that's demons. This is not God. That's not the Holy Spirit. To attribute the work of the devil to the Holy Spirit is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the one sin that Jesus says, I will never forgive. That is unforgivable. And yet this is what's happening on broadcasting networks. This is what's happening on huge volumes all over the world. And, and people are buying into this. We cannot afford to be this naive. Jeremiah 23, verses 31 and 32 says, and these are God's words. This is God's word now. God says this, I am against these smooth-tongued prophets who say, this prophecy is from the Lord. I am against these false prophets. Their imaginary dreams are flagrant lies that lead my people into sin. I didn't send or appoint them, and they have no message at all for my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. Paul's bringing up this idea of the thorn in the flesh to clearly portray before his people that God does not take orders from his servants. Not Paul, no one else. Paul is not above God. God decided to drive a stake through his chest. And Paul can't sidestep that with a doctrinal loophole or an extra-biblical revelation, or a flagrant lie. Paul says, this is the reality of apostleship. Where is their impalement? Where is their concern for the church? Where is their refusal to give up on people who hurt them? Does this not prove Paul's apostleship? He's not superhuman. He wants them to know this. I mean, look at verse 6. He goes so far as to say, though I might desire to boast, I might desire to boast. He's going, I'm not above the sinful desire to brag about myself. I'll give you that. I'd, I love to brag about myself. I might, my flesh just feeds on that. He says, but I won't let myself. Quit thinking of Paul as superhuman. He's sinful as anybody. His whole aim in this is to be transparent. He's an example to you and I. He's not an idol. Listen, this is a point of applicability for you, whether you come to this church or not. Listen to me. Never think more of someone than what you see and hear from that person. Watch their life. Listen to the way they speak. Pay attention to what they're saying when they're not behind a pulpit. Look at what he says in verse 6 at the very end. He says, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Paul goes, I don't want anybody to go thinking I'm awesome. Pay attention to me. Watch my life. Evaluate me. I invite you to do that. I'm a human being. I'm not a super apostle like they claim to be. I'm not above God like they claim to be. I'm just your normal old Joe who God decided to use in order to do great things. But I'm boasting in God, not me. If you knew me, there is nothing great about me. So we need to understand that when we read what we just read this morning, these first ten verses, all of this is coming from the heart of a man who is attempting to protect his people from false teachers and false teaching. Now, you could build a study out of all kinds of other things concerning this passage. What heaven's like, near-death experiences. You could do a whole message on that. You could do a whole message on what the thorn in the flesh is and how that relates to you and I. And there are some takeaways from this. And so I want to give you a few. What's in this for us? Beyond the 
hey guys, be careful of false teachers. Be careful of false doctrine. That's got to be clear. Be careful of what you read. Just because it's in the Christian section at Barnes and Nobles doesn't mean it's safe. Just because it's on a religious channel doesn't mean it's healthy. Okay, please. <laughs> Beware of false teaching. Another takeaway from this passage here is that blessing and suffering, blessing and suffering, tend to balance each other out. If you notice, the blessing in Paul's life was reciprocal to the suffering that he experienced. The more he was blessed, like getting a free vacation to heaven, the more he suffered with a chest impalement. The more he suffered, the more he was blessed. I mean, it's been told to me, this has been jackhammered into my brain by my own pastor, okay? For 10, 12 years now, he's been telling me, the higher the highs, the lower the lows. As a Christian, you'll find this to be true. God blesses you, blesses you, he takes you up as high as he can, but then in order to protect you from your own ego, your own pride, he has to humble you too, doesn't he? Have you ever found that to be true? Have you ever found that you're, you ever catch yourself doing really awesome as a Christian? Okay, if you ever teach the Bible consistently, you'll fall into this trap because every once in a while you'll teach a Bible study where it just like is awesome. Okay, people were moved. Okay, first time you see people taking notes while you're teaching, you're going to be like, dang right, you better take notes. Okay, you're going to move someone to emotion. They're going to come up to you afterwards and shake your hand and say, that was awesome. Watch out, man. Right there, your pride, God's blessing you as much as he can. Your pride starts notching up there and you'll be like, I am awesome. I am awesome. I mean, I really studied hard. I got a lot of good stuff. A lot of it was original. <laughs> I'm awesome. And then God's going to go, time to counter this with a little humility. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I notice this. I notice this in myself and in others. The higher God takes me, the lower he has to bring me. Another takeaway from this is that you and I are at our best when we're at our worst. Ooh, Paul says, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. Oh, what a dichotomy, doesn't this? Don't you hate that? Don't, don't you hate the, the, the nature of Scripture sometimes, how it's just kind of like, eh, you've got to be weak in order to be strong, and Paul says it very clearly here. In fact, he's quoting God when he says it. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. God has chosen to restrict his involvement in and through the life of the proud and the strong the self-confident. If you're proud and strong and self-confident, God is deliberately restricting. You aren't restricting him. God is restricting himself from working through you. He is looking for weakness. Another takeaway from this that you and I can glean from, I want you to notice that when Paul did receive that thorn in the flesh, he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He goes to God for help in this. Did you get that? Where does Paul go in his darkest hour? He goes to God. He doesn't go to alcohol. He doesn't go to a psychiatrist. He doesn't go to a bottle of meds. He doesn't turn his attention to Satan either. He didn't go to Satan and begin rebuking him. He didn't turn his attention to the Holy Spirit and start commanding the Holy Spirit. He didn't start claiming healing in Jesus' name. I remove this thorn. He pleaded for God's mercy. That's all. And after three prayers, only three prayers, he f surrendered to the perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God in this situation for Paul was great anguish. And Paul's like, if that's what, if that's what God wants, then okay. I don't want to claim it in Jesus' name. I don't want Paul to remove it if it's not his will. I, I, I don't want the Holy Spirit. Listen, I, this is welcome in my life now. And Paul says, to the extent that I'll brag about that, I'll boast on this. My infirmities, my reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, that's what makes me awesome. If anything makes me awesome, it's God's humbling of me. He says God's grace is sufficient. God's grace, sufficient means all you need. God's grace is all you need. That's our last takeaway from this, guys. You don't need anything more than God's grace. You'll know false teaching when you hear it because it always places the emphasis on something other than God's grace, health or prosperity. 
false doctrine is always greed-centered, and it always appeals to the flesh. It, it promises something for you that you and your sinful state would have wanted anyway. Who wouldn't want more money? Sinners want more money. That's what makes the lotto so popular. <laughs> so when you got a Christian doctrine that comes along and goes, God wants to make you rich, you just need to claim it. It's like, well, of course people are going to buy into that. What if, what if you start preaching that God wants to make you poor? God wants to make you like Jesus, who was homeless. God wants to make you like Jesus, who couldn't afford to pay his taxes, but had to have Peter go run an errand. Go catch a fish, dig in its mouth, you'll find a coin. That might be enough. Do you want to be like Jesus, or do you want to be like what the false prophets boast of? God's grace does not always appeal to the flesh, guys. It certainly didn't appeal to Paul's flesh when it felt like he was being impaled and God says, oh, my grace is all you need. Paul's like, uh, uh, what? What? Your grace is all I need right now? Oh, I beg to differ, but if you insist, I guess you're right. Boy, that's hard to believe right now that all I need is grace. Really, I thought I needed a surgical operation to have this thing removed. I thought the presence of what you're currently allowing in my life was going to spell death for me, but you're telling me all I need his grace. Okay, I'll trust you. If you say grace is all I need, then I guess I'll trust you. How important is it that you and I understand that grades, God's grace is sufficient? How, how important do you think that is, that you and I come to that conclusion that we need nothing more than God's grace? Is that important? Do you think that's important? Here's how important it is. Paul learned this lesson at the very beginning of his ministry. Very be 14 years ago, Paul learned this. Before his first missionary journey, he learned this before he wrote any books of the Bible. And knowing the sufficiency of God's grace alone determined the trajectory of his life's work. It was his understanding that grace is all we need that influenced the doctrine that you and I read of in the book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians. In all of Paul's writings, he has saturated the doctrine of God's grace in his work. His entire life was determined by his understanding of this. That's why Paul began Paul's, that's why God began Paul's ministry with a vision of heaven and a subsequent thorn in the flesh. It was preparatory. Paul needed both of those things. He needed the blessing of seeing heaven so that when he was shipwrecked or put in prison or beaten with rods, he remembered what he was working toward. And he needed the thorn in the flesh so that when he was blessed like he was, he didn't let his pride run away as he's writing the book of the Bible. If his pride had crept in while he was writing scripture for you and I, we might be fooled into thinking that pride was a good thing because Paul got proud and that influenced his writings, but God wasn't going to let that happen. God humbled Paul to protect me and to protect you from false doctrine. You have to understand this. The sufficiency of God's grace, we have to get a grip on this if any real work is going to be done through you or I. Our strength is insufficient. You're incapable, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of an education you have, no matter how good you are at speaking or, or, or serving or doing anything, you cannot do this without God. You, on your own strength, are insufficient for the work. Did you know that when God whittles away your strength and makes you weak and then offers you nothing but his grace, did you know that you can become, at that point, your own false apostle by demanding an easier way? When God weakens you, you have an opportunity to become your own false teacher and look for an easy way out of the discomfort that God has placed in your life to humble you and prepare you for great work. We're a danger in unto ourselves. I mean, maybe we don't go to a false church with false prophets and false... Maybe we're well protected from those things, but you yourself can become a false teacher when you encourage yourself to sidestep the pain that God requires in you to weaken you so that you can do great work for Him. 
Did you know that you become a believer in false doctrine when you reject trouble and weakness in favor of comfort and strength? Guys, this is such a deeply informative 10-verse section of Scripture that we could talk about it all day. But we need to understand that God's strength will only be seen in us and through us when we're weak. We need to understand the danger of any teaching that suggests otherwise. Even something that would be in our own mind. God would never do this to me. God would never let me feel these ways. God would never give me that much pain. Listen, you don't get to say that. We are at His mercy, not His at ours. The Apostle Paul here has worked tirelessly to bring us the truth. We must be grounded in the truth. Otherwise, like so many others, we're going to be swept away in what sounds good to the ear, what makes sense to the mind, and we find ourselves in the midst of lies, false doctrine, false teachers, false religion with a false gospel, false evangelists, false witness with a false hope, believing in false promises.